Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me from in the back? Excellent. Thank you. Welcome to our fifth lecture about the fall 2014 season. I just want to remind everyone that generous support from the Lowell Institute is what allows the Aquarium to offer these programs free of charge, and we're grateful to have their support each season. A huge and special thank you to the WGBH Forum Network for filming tonight's lecture um, and for making it available afterwards to share with your friends and family. I believe both from the WGBH website and on the Aquarium YouTube page in just a few weeks. Uh, my name is Randy Virgin. I am a research scientist here at the New England Aquarium. I am mostly known here to be, as being a benthic ecologist and a coral reef ecologist. But I actually teach a class at Boston University. I think a couple of my students are here tonight. Woo! Um, in marine urban ecology, which is sort of the genesis of thinking about this topic. So I'm really glad and really excited to have them here and to have you here to share this with me. Now, I'm going to introduce Noah, who of course is our headliner this evening. But before I do, I wanted to just help us think about the oceans for a moment before we move on to honeybees. And forgive me, I'm a little out of breath because I'm very pregnant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not used to doing this in this condition. All right. Well, when most people think of the oceans, we all think of something like this, right? Something near the surface, just underwater, something that we can visualize, some place that's almost familiar. If you've ever stuck your head underwater and opened your eyes, if you've ever been into the aquarium. Um, it's something real, it's something that's peaceful. For many of us, we think of the ocean as something pure, something bigger than us that lends perspective and peace. It's a place of calm, and it's a place that we all appreciate and enjoy. And depending on who you are, you might even use the ocean in a different way beyond the calm. You might think of it as a beach or a place to watch sunset or sunrise, um, a way to get food, a surfing location, a place for sharks. Um, and we might even think of it as a coral reef or a kelp forest or a frozen wonderland. You might use it as a place for recreational scuba diving, and I think we have the New England Aquarium Scuba Club rec you know, re represented here tonight. I think um, many of us use it as a place for boating, for swimming, and for fishing. It truly is um, a place for that many of us use, um, either on vacation or in our daily lives. Now, of course, when we think of the Earth, we think of the blue planet. I'm showing you this image mostly because we are so used to thinking of the continent view um, when we think about the world from space. But it really is the blue planet and from some perspectives. We often think about, um, you know, as I said, just the continent sort of perspective. But I want this view up to remind us all that, for example, the whole Central Pacific can fill an entire image view of our planet, um, where land is barely visible. And in, but in most cases, right, this isn't the view we take of the oceans. In most cases, especially if you were to just go outside tonight, this is what we think about. It's home sweet home. It's beautiful. It's our local waterway. I see it every day when I come to work. And it's a place where we can just appreciate the water and living coastally, which is a really nice thing um, about living in Boston. So I want to take a bird's eye view for a minute of this waterway. Come from space to the T, I know, very quickly. But <laughs> wow, this should be familiar to most of you. And it's another way to appreciate our proximity to the sea, right? There are lines here that are very familiar to all of us. There are lines that transport, um, that represent our transport system all around the city. We have the red line, the green line, the blue line, the silver line, the orange line, what am I forgetting? I think that's all of them. And um, you, know, you know, if you step on, the T at any one spot, you could end up at any one of these other spots. And if you drop your gum wrapper in one spot, it could end up in almost any one of these other spots. This is a connected transport system. So start thinking of our city for a minute, just in terms of connectivity and the way everybody's connected to each other. All right, things are about to get real for a minute. I'm going to take the lines away. You ready? Do you know where you are? <laughs> OK. So if this looks familiar, that's good. Here's the Boston Harbor again. I don't know where my pointer is, but you can kind of get the picture. And I want to point out a few other lines that you may or may not use to looking at. Let me zoom in for a minute here. So the first line that I want to point out is one that you're already very familiar with, but you don't think about as a line, as a transport mechanism. And it's the Charles River. The second is the Mystic. And the third is the Neponset. 
These are the three rivers in the Boston area that drain into the Boston Harbor. And you can see the Boston Harbor is really distinctive, right? We have sort of a C shape. It's shallow near the center. We go drop off to these shallow and highly productive banks that go into deep seas very quickly. And if you look at these waterways, they serve over a million people, and they go through many, many towns and cities. And these are the conduits to that harbor, and the conduits to that ocean. This is the connected transport system of Boston. Now, we treat these rivers reasonably well, especially these days. We're pretty good about appreciating them. We have the head of the Charles. We have lots and lots of parks and banks along the river. I mean, most of you have, I'm sure, have used the parks um, and walked along the Charles recreationally this summer, or the Mystic or the Deposit, depending on where you live. And for the most part, we don't abuse them, right? And we even have signs telling us not to abuse them. You know, we have things that say, don't dump into our riverways. And I have not ever in my entire life seen anybody standing on top of a storm drain pouring toxic waste into the river, which is a really good thing, because pre-1972 Clean Water Act, that might have happened. So <laughs> this, we live in a time where, thankfully, people don't do this, except that we do. We just do it inadvertently, and that's the problem. It rained last night, and it rained an awful lot last week. Does this look familiar? Is this a site that we're used to seeing? The, there is, every single time it rains, an opportunity to take what's in our terrestrial environment and transport it and put it into this connected waterway into the marine environment. What I also want you to notice, besides, of course, all the water pouring into the storm drain, is the perfectly manicured lawn that's directly adjacent to the strain. It's Flooded. If that lawn was recently treated with pesticides or fertilizers, it would go straight into the storm drain. And in heavy rains, that whatever goes into that storm drain would go straight into the rivers and it would go straight into the oceans. So that's exactly what we don't totally think about. We think, oh, well, it goes down the storm drain and it goes to a sewage treatment plant. That's true a lot of the time. But in heavy rains, you get what's called combined sewage overflow. I'm not going to walk you through too much of the technical detail, but this is how it works. In normal dry conditions, whatever is in your home and gets flushed out of your sink, your toilet, or shower, goes to Deer Island. But when there's heavy, heavy rains, the system gets overloaded. And there's combined sewage overflow, where not only what goes into that storm drain, but also what comes out of your sink, your shower, or your toilet gets dumped straight into the nearest local waterway. So every tap drop of water that we put into the system is an extra drop of water that overloads the system. So every drop of water that you can save is a drop of water less that is into this combined sewage overflow issue. Now, Deer Island, our sewage treatment plant, I don't want to throw them under the bus here, they're actually amazing. They're truly cut above. They are responsible for one of the greatest environmental success stories in America, the cleanup of the Boston Harbor. They did it in less than two decades. We went from being the dirtiest harbor to one of the cleanest ones. They deserve a huge amount of credit. But this is a typical situation everywhere in North America and in many other places throughout the world, it's even worse. They just, when it rains, nobody can handle that volume if you're a postal. Okay, so when it rains, everything can get through. Um, and the other thing I want to point out here is that this is where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Like I said, every drop of water that we can keep out of the storm drain is one drop of water that, suits, that Deer Island doesn't have to deal with even in normal conditions, which saves everybody time and money. And in the storm condition is what saves every single drop from being diverted away from the sewage treatment plant. OK, so we're thinking a lot about the oceans and sewage when you came here to hear about honeybees. So let me get to our six-legged friends here. The point that I want to make is that so many of the things that impact these oceans also impact these bees. Bees, of course, need green space in gardens. They need flowers. On the flip side, the lack of green space in gardens can impact our oceans by not catching the rainwater, thereby allowing more of a direct and an unfiltered deluge during a storm. Use of pesticides and fertilizers in the terrestrial environment, of course, hurts bees. And it can have other important impacts um, for insects and for a whole lot of other native wildlife. But when it rains, these chemicals also drain directly into our waterways. When we use non-native plantings, it's a problem because these species are almost always heavier water users, and they prevent less soil erosion, and they also prevent water penetration. So more water is um, 
or sorry, less water is being saved and more water is being wasted than in, in compared to native species. I know Noah is going to be talking about more of these issues shortly, which brings me almost to my close. I want to take a moment to acknowledge a dear friend and colleague who I went to graduate school with, Dr. Noah Wilson-Rich, um, who, as it turns out, is a Connecticut native, so local to the New England area, but he's called Boston home since 2000. Growing up, he was actually not a fan, not one little bit of creepy crawly things. His interests changed in high school when he participated in Project Search, which focused on aquatic invertebrate species as bioindicators for water pollution. Noah then went on to earn a BS in biology from Northeastern University and graduated from the B School at the Essex County Beekeepers Association in Topsfield, Mass. While earning his PhD in biology at Tufts, which is where I first met Noah, Noah then founded the Best Bee Company in 2010. Best Bee supplies gardeners and any other interested parties in the Boston area with beehives, as well as the resources, materials, and appropriate consultation for their upkeep. This service is a non-traditional means of raising money for research to improve honeybee health. Profits from installing and managing these honeybee hives go to fund Noah's research into bee diseases. And I just want to point out that this is an incredibly innovative thing to do. In a time when science everywhere is struggling for appropriate funding, Noah has found a way to have a very successful business model, be able to support science and primary science, which is a really something that's fun for the greater good. Currently, Noah serves as the Chief Scientific Officer and oversees all of the company activities while still remaining accessible to anybody who wants to learn more about honeybees. It's actually amazing at getting back to everyone. <laughs> while also researching the efficacy of three different vaccines for honeybees, while, for which a U.S. patent is pending, he's also managed to pen his first book, The Bee, A Natural History. And he's done this with his fellow beekeeper, Kelly Allen, and I believe the book is for sale after the lecture, um, and you're available for signing. Okay, so Noah is quite accomplished, and I want to say that I knew him before he had done all of these amazing things, <laughs> except for high school and college. But um, our scientific research has taken us in completely different directions. But here we are tonight, um, and it's because our conservation goals are very similar. For those of you who regularly attend these lectures at the aquarium, I hope I've convinced you that our terrestrial environment has the potential to directly impact our nearby coastal environment. For those of you who are new to the aquarium and you're here tonight because you're part of a garden club or an entomology society or you're a fan of Noah's or a fan of bees or you just were entitled about our, or sorry, we're excited about our title, which is the talk, <laughs> and you just wanted to get the talk in an entertaining way, I hope I've convinced you that there are linkages as well between the term marine and terrestrial environment. But for those of you who, like me, love both, almost equally, really, genuinely, I love my garden as much as I love the ocean. We don't have to choose. You can make some good decisions as a homeowner and a citizen <laughs> or a business runner um, that benefit both causes. You can install rain barrels and rain gardens to slow the flow of water during storms and prevent overloads to our sewage treatment plant. You can plant native plants. They're better for native insects, they use less water, they retain more water, and they prevent soil erosion. You can shrink your lawn and you can plant more flowers. And you can also use fewer pet fertilizers and pesticides when you do that. You can put less pollutants into our environment. Macro pollutants like trash break down into micro pollutants, which all end up in the water. You can vote with the environment in mind. Next week, for example, we have an opportunity to consider several new pieces of legislation where your vote could make an impact on the environment. Most simply, however, wherever you live, if you plant a garden and you promote more green space, um, you will make a difference. Even in the middle of the city, a few flowers can go a long way towards happy bees and happy seas. Your flowers will provide important nectar for pollinators, as well as retain water that would otherwise just be washed directly into a storm drain, especially in cities, which have more pavement than rural environments. Every single pot of dirt can make a difference, especially if there's flowers right in it. So in essence, in all the ways that exist to be green that we all hear so much about, don't forget that being green also means, in aquarium speak, to live blue. And without any further ado, I'm going to let Noah tell you his side of the story. So thank you all for your time. I think I will hold this. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I am Noah Wilson-Rich. It is a pleasure to be here to speak with each of you tonight. 
I am just so happy. So thank you, Randy, for the introduction. I will also add a little bit more about Randy, which is that Randy comes from a B background. When Randy was an undergrad at Cornell, Randy worked with Tom Seeley and uh, many other wonderful researchers at Cornell University to do honeybee research. And then Randy kind of changed it up for myself. I actually applied to more marine biology graduate programs than <laughs> B programs, than any other type. It's just kind of how life works, right? And I don't think any of you are here today because you only have one interest. I don't know anybody who does have just one thing. I am more than a bee man, for example. I have many interests. And that's really the theme of here tonight. We want to live green and we want to live blue. We don't have to choose one. We don't have to do one thing at all. All that we can do is really keep our minds open to how to combine everything. And it makes living a bit more realistic. So that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. And some of these things can be a bit of a downer. So we've learned a bit about how our actions can affect the seas, even one piece of litter that we put down on the ground, or that we see somebody else put down on the ground, but just kind of let it go because we don't want to make a scene. That will get taken in by some transport system, and God knows where it will end up. With bees, it is not much more of a bright story here, but that's really why you're here tonight, isn't it? To learn a little bit more about what's happening and what we can each do and what the current state of our world is. Bees are dying. We know this. And tonight I'll step you through really three different parts of my own talk, and that's going to be essentially past up to today, and then our present, and then also our future. Because our future is going to be a little bit weird. I think we can all agree upon that. I mean, thinking about iPhones, even this thing in my hand that's projecting my voice and my breath, these are weird things that have advanced already. And even if we can't understand radio and space flight, it doesn't mean that we should prevent them from happening. It's just because we don't understand it yet. So I'm going to help guide everybody a little bit more towards what a future of with living with bees and living with all types of conservation in mind, what that future can look like. I want for each of you to leave here as an ambassador of such things. So that's my call for you. I'm not going to teach you why bees are so important. I think you already know that. I think the collective consciousness of humanity knows this. And that's why I put this big cover of Time Magazine from last year up here. This is part of our current understanding. But what we don't understand is how to connect the dots. So I'm going back to the seas here, and we'll kind of flip back and forth. We're going to get wet again, which is fun. What's maybe a little bit more serious here is in 2006, that's when bees started disappearing. They weren't just dying. We weren't finding the bodies. This was called colony collapse disorder. How bizarre is that? That's what made this different. It wasn't just that bees were dying. Oh, yeah, we need more pollinators. Boo-hoo. It was like, uh, there's a little bit more to this story. Where did they go? That's what really made it a bigger issue. And what I'm here to tell you about today is that this wasn't just the bees in 2006. What happened that year? Bees started vanishing in Pennsylvania, really in apple orchards. That's where migratory beekeepers make a stop when they're moving pollinators from monoculture crop to monoculture crop. These are areas where there's only one thing growing. So there's only one blossom. So apple blossoms might happen in the springtime. And then when those flowers fall off, the bees have to move. There's no more food for them. So they go from California's <laughs> almonds to blueberries in Maine to cranberries in Massachusetts to Florida's oranges and so forth because it's the current state of the US agricultural system. 2006 in our oceans also had some problems. And what I'm here to show you about is in 1991, that's when we started recording data really for these unexplained mortality events in the oceans. This is from NOAA, so the National Oceanographic uh, Administration and Atmospheric Administration here. So this is government data available for free. Anybody has access to it, but nobody's connected these dots. Let's look forward a little bit from 1981 to see just where this goes. In terms of the number of unexplained mortality events, it kind of stayed level from 1991 through to 2002 for that decade. And then something kind of changed, and it's going up a little bit. And in 2006, we see this spike. 
to a record number of these unexplained mortality events. What happened in 2006? I don't know. But there were five different events. So this ranges from North Atlantic humpback whales, mass die-offs. We had Alaskan sea otters. We had, um, I mean, a, a, a record number. So this is the point here. We don't exactly know what's happening. Bats also started dying off in 2006 in New York State. We have an opportunity now to learn from this. Even if we don't know what happened, this is somewhat of a canary in a coal mine on land, in the seas. If we can learn something from this, perhaps we can prevent the future from happening again in the same way. Now what I do is I am a researcher. My research today focuses on bee health and finding ways to improve bee health. I do still apply for grants in the traditional funding method. I do still teach in academia. And I've seen some of my students here tonight from Northeastern Simmons. I'll say hello, hello to you. Couple Thank you for coming. Um, so that is uh, something that has not been successful. This is my 10th year in a row of National Science Foundation rejections. And I wear that as a badge of pride because we are going for 11 and 12 and we will keep going. But if I had only applied for traditional grant funding, I would not be here today most likely because I would not be able to make progress in my own research. It's very challenging. There's a lot of competition for limited funding. So what we do is we've thought outside the box. We sell beehives. One day in graduate school, I started thinking, OK, graduation is pending. The economy stinks. What am I going to do? So I consider myself to be a product of a bad economy. And I said, I'm going to get up my butt and start selling beehives. And I'll volunteer my time to raise funding for research. So all the beehives that I managed starting in 2010, and same thing through today with a great team now, all that honey belongs to our clients. The bees belong to the clients. The hive is theirs. We're just in it for the research funding. So it's a really different model, but it's proven successful. And we have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for research this way. It is innovative. It's different. We even have a van now, so I don't have to transport bees on the subway. Right? I mean, that's how I got started. We have a great team now. We have interns from many different colleges. People are even flying in now to spend their summers with us from Grinnell College, from Cornell, from Colby. It's been amazing. So we're educating students. We've got postdocs. We've got a great team. There are actually 12 beehives in this picture. You can't see it too well, but this is in Cambridge. This is one of our clients that has beehives right next to a public parking lot. You wouldn't even know. We've been able to work with municipalities, too, to be very helpful. Sometimes bees can swarm. It's typically a springtime thing. This is when a beehive has a baby, in a way. Sometimes we think about superorganism theory. It's something that E.O. Wilson at Harvard and Bert Holdobler's colleague wrote a book about. You can think about one beehive or a social organism here as one animal. And when that one large animal, so the queen is the ovaries and the reproductive system, and the worker bees are the blood cells, and the guard bees out front might be the skin, that superorganism just had a baby, and it looks like this. And we often see that these bees don't really think about where to go just yet. They're just going off into the environment. So we work with different cities to be the resource so they can call us like this in Dorchester when the bees swarmed to a yellow car and then we just went out and collected them and we brought them back to our lab to the bee sanctuary which is a funny name for our parking lot it's also like a bee hospital in a way and we make sure that the bees are healthy so that we can sell them off to help generate more funding for our research it's been a really fun system, and we can help people that way. Now, the TED organization found out about my research laboratory, about our company, and all the things that we're doing, and invited me to give a TED Talk. And my first TED Talk was in 2012 here at TEDx Boston. It was a great experience. I got wonderful feedback from people around the world about all these different ideas and how bees can help different types of ecological problems, of course, the economy, and getting more fruits and vegetables. This is something that might be a little bit counterintuitive, and this is what I presented in my TED Talk in 2012. This is our bee sanctuary, so we are in an auto body shop now. We're no longer in my living room, which is where I started the company. I had no money, I just started a Facebook page, and I said, anybody want a beehive? What we've learned from having bees in an urban area is that they seem to prefer it. It's not just a fad. Urban beekeeping is so much more, and what the data show 
are that bees make more honey in Boston and in Cambridge than outside of the cities. And they survive the winter at higher rates than outside of the city. There's a fitness, so a survival uh, and reproductive benefit here. They're more productive and they survive better in the city than outside. You have to listen to what the data are saying in order to think about what's best for the bees. It might be counterintuitive, but we can really use those data to be innovative. So we work with many of the hotels and restaurants in Boston, like the Intercontinental Hotel. They do really fun painted beehives. The restaurant is called Miel, so French for honey. They have a camera at the entrance of the beehive. You can watch the bees from the lobby. It's great stuff. We even work with real estate companies here, like on the right. This is a client in the south end that thought about putting the beehive higher up so that Ahab, the dog, is safely out of reach from his sniffing nose inside the hive. So what I was able to do then is write a book. I downloaded all the information from my brain, and I put all of the info that people around the world were telling me about how that TED Talk was received. And I used that global perspective to tie together everything I know about bee health and conservation in general and what you can do, any individual person can do, to help the bees. Kelly Allen is also my first student whom I published with on my own. So that was really great, too. So the future for the Best Bees Company is bright, but the future for bees themselves remains a bit more opaque. And that's something I really want to share with each of you tonight as we get into the present issues. Now, in 2006, I mentioned colony collapse disorder started. That's when beekeepers were finding 100% of their bees gone from apiaries across the country. Not everybody had that high a loss, but we were seeing rates that high. And these are associated with this migratory beekeeping route primarily. This can be a big problem for many reasons. But I'm going to teach each of you how we can play a role in preventing these bees from living on flatbed trucks. Today, in the United States, more honeybees live on a flatbed truck than do not, if you can believe that. It's really a different world for bees than from when our grandparents were here. Late September, I wrote an article for the New York Times, an op-ed piece, that presented information that scientists seemed to know but were, wasn't really getting communicated to the general public, that colony collapse disorder seems to have ended. And this is something new and perhaps startling to hear. Because you might think, okay, well, bees are doing great. You know, they're only dying now at a 30 to 40% rate each year instead of 100%. But wait, 30 to 40% is still really high. So bees are still dying, and that's the take-home message. We're just finding their dead bodies now. It's still quite a sad and difficult story. But with that being known now, that rate has stabilized, and we have an opportunity to figure out how to change that. We know that bees are important for a lot of reasons. They produce much of our food, over 100 different fruit and vegetable crops. They contribute over $15 billion every year to the US economy alone. This is for their role as pollinators. Around the globe, that's over $100 billion into the global economy for their role. So this is really important for any of you who might think, oh, I don't really like bees and like my father. I don't eat fruits and vegetables. You know, what do I care? So let's try to put it to your day-to-day -day lives here. If you think about what your lunch might look like at a picnic in a world with bees, you can look on the left or what your breakfast could look like in a world with bees, and now without bees. You know, it's not that we're going to run out of food here, it's just that we're going to have a lot of carbs. It's less colorful. So bees don't pollinate everything, but it really does change our quality of life. This has impacted so many things around the world, including policymakers, where now we even have our first beekeeper in the White House. You can see the little beehive on the bottom left there. And this has also impacted businesses to think about their own sustainability record. We have beehives at many national and corporate headquarters. It's spreading around the globe. Now, Europe tends to be a place that's very advanced for their conservation policy. France has always been a leader in urban beekeeping. They were the first ones to start promoting, as a government level, beekeeping incentives for the residents, encouraging the French to get more bees. If you contrast this with some places in America, such as Palm Springs, let's say, there's a permit required that costs $2,000 per beehive in Palm Springs. So if we weigh this, we have a financial incentive in France, and then you have basically a penalty or only the wealthiest can afford to have a beehive. 
you're putting down pollinators here. In Kenya, I had the opportunity to visit Nairobi and work with the Samburu tribe in north central Kenya. And they were um, amazing beekeepers. They had great opportunities in the city of Nairobi to train the general public on how to be a beekeeper, how to build a beehive. So great opportunities for education, creating jobs in Nairobi compared to, let's say, Miami, and now even Cambridge, where the governments are taking residents to court because of beehives. There was recently a cease and desist order in Cambridge served to a little kid's school for using bees as part of their educational program. We're hoping that this was just kind of a rogue member of City Hall and Inspectional Services, but it seems uh, that people are lawyering up and taking to the streets. And if we need to do that, I think it's important to at least educate ourselves to know what's happening here. Lastly, just last comparison, in Australia, there's a national consortium of universities around the country that have gotten together, so they're all sharing research, combining resources. The bees in Australia today are the healthiest, perhaps, around the entire world. They don't have the same diseases that other places of the world have, such as the Varroa mite. Compare that to Los Angeles. The policy is kill honeybees upon sight. You are not allowed to keep bees in Los Angeles. You must murder them. You have to exterminate bees. That started in the 1800s when people thought that bees attacked fruit. Clearly misconception. And in 1917, there was an article in the Los Angeles Times that said we need to repeal this outdated law. 100 years later, we're still talking about it. That's clearly preventing jobs. My company looked to move there to start a new office, and we couldn't. So we couldn't expand our company there, and also that's preventing local food production, impacting businesses negatively. It's a big problem. So one thing that we know, going back to the data from just last year, is that there's so much more to this story than just honeybees. Perhaps there's an over-reliance upon honeybees, and I want to share these data with you. These are, again, freely available, published by Jeff Pettis and colleagues in a journal called PLOS One. I love the name of that, Public Library of Science. And what I'll show you here is we're looking at the proportion of the crops that are being pollinated on the y-axis here, so on the left-hand side, and then you're looking at the type of crop on the x-axis here, okay? These are looking at where the bees from those flatbed trucks are going. If a farmer for almonds, for example, the bar on the left-hand side, is renting honeybees to pollinate almonds, this research group then went into those beehives, collected pollen, and they looked at seeing which plant the pollen's from. For almonds and for apples, most of that pollen was from those crops, as we would expect. However, what we've now learned just from last year is that for the other crops, blueberries, cranberries, cucumbers, watermelons, pumpkins, growers are paying money to rent honeybees to pollinate those crops, and the honeybees don't want to pollinate those crops. <laughs> it's like giving medicine to a child, and the child doesn't find it tasty. They're not going to eat it, right? It's not going to work. This is another thing we need to learn about the current U.S. agricultural system. It is a problem. Perhaps this over-reliance on honeybees is hurting the bees, and perhaps we can get some of those bees off of flatbed trucks and pay attention to the 20,000 other species of bees that are out there, of which we've got 4,000 native species of bees in North America. Honeybees aren't native to here. What's going on with the other bees? Are we not getting all these other crops? I see a ton of pumpkins out there. I'm sure you do too. So we still get pumpkins, but what's going on? And is there a better way to do this? Can farmers save the money? Can bees get off the trucks? Can the cost of food go down then because we don't have to pay for these unneeded pollinators? And can we think about ways to promote other bees and native bees? just like thinking about planting native seeds to help prevent runoff and many other reasons. Here's what I'm going to teach you how to do now. Here's how to do it, right? So here's what we're bringing brought now to today. This idea of bee hotels is something that's really important to consider. Many people think about bees as a nuisance, as a problem. And I understand that. I'll be the first to admit it, right? As Randy said, I wasn't the kind of kid who grew up playing in the dirt, playing with bugs. I get this perspective, but bees tend to live in crevices. Maybe you hear these stories about 50,000 bees just removed from a woman's wall and from this man's roof. You know, 
this happens, and people think of it as a nuisance. But what if we can flip that? What if we can design architecture to encourage bees to live in the walls? It's crazy. I get it. But follow me here. What if we can put a pipe through that beehive, or put pipes throughout the walls, that can then have water being pumped through? Honeybees keep their nests about 90, 92 degrees in the wintertime. They do this by cuddling. They contract their wing muscles very rapidly, and it generates heat as a group. They generate heat by eating honey. That's why bees produce honey here. If we can harness that heat to heat our homes, think about how much money we could save collectively. How much do we spend on insulation? What do we use to insulate our homes with? Thankfully, it's not asbestos anymore. We know how harmful that was. But what are we doing with insulation these days? And can we do a better job by giving pollinators a home? It's just a wacky idea. Where I live in Dorchester, we have a beehive on our front deck. We have a chair on either side, and we use it as a cocktail table. So we can even think beyond living architecture and now into functional furniture by creative design that incorporates pollinators into our way of living. This is something that is a really fun project for anybody to do. You can think about whatever trash you have around the house and repurpose it to make a habitat for native bees. You set it and forget it. You can think about wine corks on the bottom left. Maybe you're having a date night with somebody and you want to put together bee habitat. That's a cool date to me, I guess. Maybe some to you. Think about other things, pine cones, logs, bricks. You can design it in a fun way, however you put it together in a box. You're repurposing things. Put a shoebox out, put an old t-shirt, whatever. And then you put it outside and you see what might move in. And don't get bugged out by it. Don't get weirded out by it because you're actually promoting habitat for bees. You're creating this. And that's something that is good for the bees and for the seas alike. Looking at some other amazing things you could find, we have a beautiful picture of a leaf cutter bee that cuts out petals from flowers and then glues them together and moves in. She just needs a space to, to do that. That's something you could find. You even see these iridescent green sweat bees. These are in our backyards today. We just don't necessarily notice them. They give us a lot of food that we're not giving them credit for. Businesses are har harnessing this idea too. This is from the St. Ermans Hotel in London on the rooftop. They have given space to bees by creating bee hotels within a human hotel. We can live together with bees in a very creative, innovative way that encompasses, encompasses design. Think about vision with bees. The world to a bee is very different from how you and I see it. Bees don't see the red spectrum, but they do see ultraviolet. So things that look white, let's say to us, could look blue to a bee. It's interesting to look at the world through a bee's eyes, but if you use color, cool colors, purples, blues, those are things that bees see and they tend to like. The world is very hot to us. We see reds and yellows and oranges much more than bees do. It's a very cool world to them. In Asia, they've really taken to this idea of habitat for bees, and they allow bees to remain where they want to live. This is a temple in Bhutan. They let the bees live there. It's okay. We like pollinators. It's something that we're pushing towards, even if we're not just there yet. Perhaps a house of the future could look something like this. It has habitat to allow native bees and pollinators to move into. It's not too crazy, right? We can even repurpose wooden shipping pallets to be some type of creative table in landscaping. You can think about having parties around it or weddings at event centers. You can make it look very beautiful. And looking even further into the future, perhaps a home could look like this. It's very bright. It's based on living with nature, living together instead of constantly fighting it. The last thing I will do with you tonight is I'm going to show you a little bit into the future with bees. Now, this is a solitary bee. Solitary bees and other bees alike have a really unique tongue. It's kind of like a straw here. And what you can do is actually train bees to be very helpful to humans. So we've gone from the past to saying, ah, bees. Right, I get that. Many people think bees are the same as hornets or wasps. They're not. Those are cousins. They split off about 100 million years ago in evolutionary history. Bees are vegan, and wasps and hornets are 
omnivorous carnivores as well. So these are the nice vegan ones, okay? They do have stingers. I have fists. I'm not using them, right? They can use them. You know, I'll use them if they're you know, needed, but it's not needed right now. So with these, we can think about a future of living with bees, how we can help them and they can help us by training a bee to stick out her tongue when we need her to. Follow me here. This is going to get a little bit crazier. Think about Pavlov and his experiments. If you remember Pavlov's dogs. So we're thinking about conditional um, training here, so some, some classical conditioning with, as Pavlov did, he rang a bell and gave a bone to a dog, and then that dog would eventually learn that association to the point at which Pavlov could ring a bell, and the dog would salivate. All right, so what if we do something like that with the bee? What if we have a bee with her tongue in, and then we present her with a food source, and then she says, hmm, I like that, I want some. You can do it looking like this. It's called a proboscis extension response test, or reflex. Now, you have a food, like the sugar water here, and then you have that association with a particular odor on the left-hand side. And you see her sticking her tongue out here. That association is learned to the point at which you no longer need this sugar water. It's absent. So that now she's sticking her tongue out to an odor. Okay, not too crazy. A little weird, but not too crazy, right? Now, what's kind of cool is you can do this three times, so this three trials, and the bee's memory remains over 72 hours. She can learn that association and remember it more so with three times rather than one time. It's kind of like how I was as a student. You know, I like, they tell me a couple times and then I'll get it. Same thing with bees. What if you put a tracking device on the bee and then let her go out? What could happen then? What if you released a bee and then had her go to perhaps a flower that this bee species is not naturally associated with? So if honeybees are gone, and honeybees are the only pollinator of almonds, the USDA and other researchers are already training bees to pollinate almonds, ones that don't normally do this, for example, the blue orchard bee. So that's one association. Follow me in this next one. What if you replace that odor with something totally not associated with bees, such as bombs, <laughs> bomb sniffing bees? If you train a bee to sense a bomb and then release that bee, maybe a hundred bees, into a minefield, and they all go to a particular spot, you can clear that mind without having to harm anything. And you get some sense of accuracy, because if there are 95 of those 100 bees, you say, okay, well, maybe we're 95% confident that we have to clear a mine right over there. That's pretty cool, right? Kind of weird. What if we don't release the bees, but if we kept them at home? So if we kept the bees in a handheld sniffing device, and they could sense bombs at an airport, this is also already happening with other companies. They're developing this in Europe and in Ireland specifically, I believe, so that what if one day we don't have to take our shoes off at the airport, or we don't have to do all the expensive screening that we do today, and you just have these sniffing devices. Again, with much more accuracy than perhaps one bomb sniffing dog could have, right? Sample size of one versus 100. And what's really cool about this is that the bees can go home at the end of their eight hour work day. I don't have to kill them. You know, they're just at work, right? It's really interesting if you think about this futuristic kind of pixelated vision, but the bees are in their chairs, and there's a sensor telling you when the bees stick their tongues out and with some degree of accuracy. This is something that really has the potential to change the world. This is being used in the slums of Mumbai to test for human health thinking about diabetes, if you can test for a blood sugar level through some type of a breath analysis into a tube, this will help people who don't have access to health care and they don't have resources to go to a doctor. That's already happening. We have that happening in many slums, many different diseases. We even have this happening in the developed world to test for cancer. What if you could breathe into a tube and you have bees that have very, very sensitive antennae and sensing devices for chemical cues that are learned. They have learned to associate some type of an odor with that response, and then you get an indicator of some type of a cancer or other type of disease happening. This is our future with bees, and all that it really takes is for us to keep our minds open 
to understand that even if there's one little thing that you do anywhere around the world, whether you plant a flower or you put some trash out in a neatly organized way and allow some pollinators to move in, that you can make a difference. Everything is intermingled, whether it's on land and you're living green or whether it's in the seas, plants have an important role for both. If you live in the city and you don't have any space on your rooftop or if you don't have a garden, you can do what's called seed bombing, which is very trendy. But beyond the trend, it's still important. You just throw a handful of preferably native seeds out to the side of a highway to any abandoned property and you're creating more flowers. That will prevent runoff from all of the chemicals and things we were talking about, fertilizers. You can also create habitat this way for bees. You're giving them food. Anybody can play a role and everything is interconnected. You don't have to think about, oh, I want to recycle. Of course you do that. You do every little thing that you can, and you try to educate the masses so that not only you are ambassadors, but that you're passing it on and paying it forward. If we do this today, we can change the world for tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. I think we have a couple minutes for questions. We do. Well, we have many. <laughs> um, okay, right here in the front. Um, I was, I've heard of the uh, using bees to possibly detect cancer. How long would it take them to train them, and how long are their lives? So if we use honeybees, let's say, the average life of a worker honeybee in the active season is about a month. So the training could happen, let's say, within three days if you space those three training sessions out by a day or less even, and then you're kind of good to go. But you need some kind of a pipeline going. What's really amazing about cancer or any other type of human health issue is that bees are everywhere, as we saw from that temple in Bhutan. You know, whether we want them there or not, maybe they're different species, but they have similar response to the scent and to food. So this is something that's essentially cost-free. Maybe that handheld device or whatever kind of balloon that we're using would have some cost to it, but it's knowledge-based and it's about spreading ideas. So um, it's certainly in the future, it's being worked on now as a pilot study, but I think it has a lot of potential, especially in areas of the world that don't have access to, to resources. I think somebody Can you get those bees to hatch out at different times of the year? Or are they limited to like one short period? Yes, so uh, the question is about can bees hatch out at different times of year or are they limited to a short period? And they can hatch out at all different times of year. What's uh, one amazing thing about honeybees, and again, that's one out of 20,000 different species of bee, but uh, honeybees are around the world. They're a global species, and this is something that has a bit of variation to it. So we have different types of bees. For example, around here, we work with Italian honeybees quite often. They're not aggressive, and they do well in our environment. But other parts of the world, they have their own slight variations. They can hatch at any time of year, really. Yeah. Green shirt. What caused the crash of 06? And you guys brought it up, but who would you vote for? Uh, so with Colony Collapse 2006, um, we still don't know. There are multiple hypotheses out there. The three leading hypotheses for what threatened honeybees in 2006 and today are number one, habitat loss. That is a huge unifying theme between everything that we're talking about tonight and something that any of you can help with, habitat loss. The second thing is diseases. There are so many different infections of bees around the world, just like with humans, that's a huge problem. Today, there's a fungal infection of the gut and the blood called nosema, and that is something that's kind of a hidden infection. That's a problem. The third thing is chemicals. So another unifying theme here when we're talking about pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, fertilizers, these are things that are affecting bees in different ways. Um, Dr. Alex Liu at the Harvard School of Public Health has published at least two data papers that support a link with neonicotinoid pesticides. He has a link with 2006 as being when Monsanto and Bayer put a new um, product on the market. Again, this is one hypothesis that's been put forward by uh, Dr. Alex Liu and his colleagues with a couple data papers 
but there are questions about the papers, and the science is a really never-ending process. So more data are needed to really understand what happened and to understand how to prevent it from happening again. I think what we can all do is just at least focus on creating more habitat for them, if not getting bees for yourself. Politics. Politics. <laughs> I'll take that. Um, <laughs> As an employee of the New England Aquarium, I need to officially state that the New England Aquarium does not advocate for or have a position towards any policy or legislation coming up next week. However, as a private citizen, <laughs> um, let me simply say that um, there are at least four questions on the ballot next week, and there are some really important political positions open. I think I'd be more comfortable talking about this one-on-one -on -one afterwards, but let me simply say that there are a few, for example, that are very clearly um, aimed at having an impact on the environment. There is the bottle bill, which is a really important one to consider, and there are lots of initiatives, um, both by people and in the ballot questions, that would impact what our cities look like and what our infrastructure looks like. And um, if you do your homework and just sort of think, what? I would, hmm, this is getting really awkward and uncomfortable very quickly. I would, I think I would recommend that um, you look at the environmental platform of each candidate, that you consider what pollutants and what trash can do to our environment and ways in which we can clean them up. And sometimes political action is the best way to incentivize some of those changes. And I I think that's probably about as far as you're going to be able to push me to go. <laughs> I'll just add on one thing to this, which is a concept called behavioral economics, which might sound fancy, but really what it comes down to is thinking about creative ways to incentivize behavior and a behavioral change. So if we're thinking about the environment and conservation, there's one particular question about the bottle bill that's looking at a way to relate money, some financial benefit, to recycling. And what it comes down to is recycling. It comes down to a conservation effort and whether or not you think that this is a good incentive or a bad incentive, and that's totally up to you. It's something that uh, many governments do as well, and it's something that can really uh, help make important change for our future. Policymakers have this in their hands, thinking about tax benefits. If having a beehive on your property makes you a farm, for example, or if you get a, a property tax you know, benefit, something like that for doing a green rooftop that could prevent runoff. So those are the types of uh, legislation I would love to see in discussion. And um, the rest is up to each of you. But do vote, regardless yes. of which. Vote, however you vote. Vote. Question in the back. I love this. I, absolutely. It's I mean, a brainstorming session. This you know, is great. This is my goal, to get each of you thinking and then to set you free with those ideas. And I'm not one of the scientists who gets too worried about scooping. You know, I don't want to keep my ideas to myself. I'm actually quite the opposite, and I want to put them out there. And I love how you're thinking about, OK, what else can this do? That's the future. Yes, if you think about training a bee to ascent or a group of bees and then setting them out there, bees can fly for miles. So you, you can track where they're going, and I think there's potential there. Here we talk a question. Along with that, you showed the bees being trained kind of in these little chairs and in the sniffer in the little chairs. How do you get the bee in the chair? <laughs> <laughs> this brings us back to graduate school. So, uh, so um, I learned a trick. It was my first experiment uh, back in fall of 2005 when I started working with bees. Um, how long a bee can sleep for? Bees and other insects will fall asleep when they're cold. So that's how you can anesthetize a bee. You can make her put her on ice or uh, in a fridge for a little while. You can also anesthetize a bee with carbon dioxide, and there's a little bit of a, a chamber, like a petri dish. You can put a bee in with some holes and just knock her out. She'll wake up, but it makes bees much easier to handle. Right there in the middle, gray shirt. Yes, honeybees do have stingers. However, I'll add that they die when they sting. So um, I tend to say they're not particularly motivated to do so, but that's a little bit of anthropomorphism going on there. Who knows the bee's motivation? 
Um, so, so there are bees in, out in the environment all the time. So um, the risk of having a beehive on a property really does not increase the risk of being stung unless you're the beekeeper and going into the beehive. Bees are different from wasps and hornets in that those do not die when they sting. They are kind of, I say, steak knives with wings. So they can continue to go. Wasps and hornets tend to be the ones that will bother you at a picnic or go in your kind of sweet and sticky drinks. And honeybees tend to go right to flower patches. So it's all part of that education, and, and I'm glad you asked the question, have the dialogue. Yep. Um, how does the habitat differ between a traditional beehive and some of those like uh, recycled ones vary? Hmm. Um, so how does the habitat differ between a traditional beehive, we tend to call these Langstroth beehives, this is a box type hive that was invented in the 1800s and people have tried to make advances on it, but you really got it right the first time. Um, how does that vary from other types of bee hotels, as we might call them? And it, it, it is the same habitat, these bee hotels can go anywhere because we've got tens of thousands of bee species, so they tend to not compete. Um, instead, if they meet at flowers, they can, what I say, is give a high five, not literally, but bees pollinate in different ways as well. So some of these crops, like blueberries and cranberries, require what's called buzz pollination. Bumblebees are big and fat and fuzzy, and because they're so big, they can shake a flower and they can shake the pollen out, like a salt and pepper shaker. Think about it that way, compared to a honeybee that's smaller and fuzzier, and they tend to roll around, like, oh, this is so comfy, cozy, but they get the pollen on them and they don't have to shake it. They're not able to do so. So they pollinate different things in different ways, and it's really important for us and for growers of these crops to understand what type of pollen or their crops need and how to promote those habitats. One current project at uh, the Best Bees Company that we're working on is how to promote bumblebee habitat working with blueberry growers coming off this research. What if we can just get a modified shoe box, right? Thinking about repurposing trash. If we design it in, let's say, different colors, different positions outside in the field with different sized holes. So one of the projects we're working on with a couple interns, um, college students who are awesome. We're going to put it out in the winter time, kind of set it and forget it. Bees tend to make a new um, nest in the spring, and then we'll check it in the fall and we'll identify what species moved in, see if it's matched to the crops, and then put that info out there. And here's how you modify a shoe box to get more crops and more profit and get the honeybees off of the trucks. Most of the bees they used were from Nebraska and areas like that. And the die off, I think, was in the Midwest. Does anybody know exactly why there was such a tremendous event like that? So it sounds like as though you're asking about what's impacted the almond crops negatively? Yes. Yes, so almonds are the only crop that are 100% reliant on honeybees for pollination. Nothing else pollinates almonds. The past In the past five years, the cost of almonds has doubled, and that is also linked with the cost that growers of almonds have to pay for renting these beehives. As we see up here in this figure, Louisiana down south, places that are warmer tend to be where bees hang out for the winter time, and then when pollination occurs in the springtime, that's when they'll be moved. So late February, early March is when the um, almonds are in bloom, so they're all brought out there, about two million beehives, essentially all the beehives in the country, if you kind of don't count the backyard beekeepers. So it has to do with the cost of, of honeybees and also environmental conditions as well. So it's not just the honeybees, but also the severe droughts happening in California and some other ecological factors as well. I think we have time for two more questions. How about red vests? How are genetically modified crops affecting bees and are people modifying crops to make more essential bees pollinate? Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so genetically modified crops, it's something that uh, we don't have much data on today, but what I will add uh, to, to clarify really what's already on the screen here is with Dr. Alex Liu's hypothesis about this link between new nicotinoids and colony collapse disorder is that many of these migratory beekeepers will take the majority of the honey from these beehives. So there's a big benefit to the migratory beekeepers. It's often multi-generational families that are doing this and they sell off the honey. So they make a profit that way as well. And I am in no way calling out the migratory beekeepers. I have a tremendous amount of respect for people in this industry. It is hard work. 
However, many of those beekeepers will replace the honey with an artificial feed for the bees. It's bee food, right? So they'll replace it with high fructose corn syrup. And there are videos of this happening, which is the big hose going into a bucket feeder inside a beehive on the truck. Now, what happened in 2006 was that Monsanto and some other uh, colleagues changed the, the game with corn, and it's not a genetically modified corn as much as it is a systemic pesticide. If you think about a corn seed and what color it is, right? So you think yellow or brown like popcorn. Change that now to M&Ms. They're brightly colored seeds. The mark that this is a patented type of seed, and it's a different seed. It makes the corn toxic. It makes the corn take up those neonicotinoid pesticides, and it systemically into itself becomes a pesticide, and beekeepers unknowingly then feed their bees pesticides, and that's something that Dr. Luce has started in 2006. So that's kind of the closest link that we have between any type of modification of a crop to, to bee health at this time. We'll take one more question, and then I'll wrap it up here. Uh, hi, I see a hand of a student of mine. I can't resist, Brittany. <laughs> Ah, uh, Brittany's a plant, I think. Yes. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> Brittany just took my marine urban ecology class. So she asked me what else cities can do. So first of all, um, we have an incredible opportunity, and we have already done some incredible things. So for example, the Big Dig, controversial at the time, but nobody can argue now with what the Greenway has done. Have you noticed how many native plantings there are on the Greenway? and how little, there is lawn, but how little of it is lawn and how much of it is peaceful. We are designing new city spaces, new urban spaces, which are a pleasure to walk through and do an incredible amount for both insects, water retention, and native seed dispersal, and birds, and about a zillion other little things, and larger things which I'm probably forgetting about. So it's really exciting to watch cities be innovative. Boston's not the only one. Of course, there's the High Line in New York City. I mean, there are projects absolutely everywhere that I think green infrastructure, urban infrastructure is beginning to happen. And we're incorporating it into our building and design, mostly because I think everyone's realized that green space is nice. <laughs> and it's helpful, and it's lovely, and it actually promotes commerce, and it promotes walkability, and it promotes the livability of a city. So I think continuing to incorporate green infrastructure is very important. There are other things which are a little bit less obvious, which are also possible. Things like porous pavement, or when you can put in a green roof, which isn't going to be something you can walk on, but um, necessarily, but it's a beautiful, it can provide an awful lot of ecosystem services, which is what um, humans can gain from a natural product. But there are also other kinds of things, even something as simple as painting a black surface white can change the temperature differential and can make an impact in terms of climate change and the water cycle. And so there are, I mean, the list is endless, as Brittany well knows. But, um, <laughs> you know, there are just so many things that we can think about that um, can deal with water absorption, that can help to promote native plantings, that can promote extra green space, um, and that can turn all of this pavement into something useful and more beautiful, and a place that can be a bit of a habitat refuge instead of just a habitat ender. And so I think that's probably a good way for us to end and to say that I, there are lots of things that we do for the oceans that we do specifically for the oceans. And there are lots of things that we do for bees or for pollinators or for monarch butterflies or for your favorite tree species that's going extinct or pick your species, right, that are specific to those things. But there are so many shared conservation agendas that impact everybody the same way. And in those cases, when you do nothing, you're not just doing nothing for the one species that you might care about. You're doing nothing for any of those things. And when you do one thing, you're not just helping the one little thing that you want it to help. You're helping everything. So it doesn't take much. It's a bit of a ripple effect to make a couple of changes, including flower pots, but including and including voting, and including forest pavement, and including plant, you know, putting out a seed bomb or a bunch of other ideas that we've heard tonight to make a huge impact. So I just want to thank you all for your time, and thank Noah so much for lending us a very unusual topic.